This is the open source at work, how to contribute on the clock talk. If that's the talk you're here for, you are in the right place. Um, if you're looking for another talk, you'll want to click back over on sessions and, and find the card for that. Um, my name is Dwayne O'Brien. Uh, I work at indeed.com. My pronouns are he, him. You can see my Twitter handle and my email address there. Feel free to take pictures. I've granted permission for recording. Feel free to, to blog about it, email me uh, or, or tweet about it. Uh, love to get some feedback on this particular talk. But, uh, <clears throat> um, brief background about me. I'm the head of open source at Indeed. So I run uh, the entire open source program office. Um, my current projects, I'm heavily involved in a project called FOSS Responders. If you look at FOSSresponders.com, you can see information about that. Uh, and I also uh, drive the FOSS Contributor Fund at Indeed and drive adoption of that at other companies. And you can read about that at go.indeed.com slash FOSS Contributor Fund. Uh, my most recent contribution uh, for open source was a pull request to add a particular PDF to a form uh, a PDF of a form to uh, a repository as part of the to-do group, um, which was a couple weeks ago. Uh, I'm trying to pivot to talk about my most recent contribution rather than telling the story of how I first got involved in open source uh, uh, in an effort to invite more people to to share their recent contributions uh, as opposed to maybe some, some pedigree information. Now, logistically, I can see questions that come up in chat in the bottom right corner as they come up. I will be unlikely to end address questions as we're going through the talk, but I'm going to leave time uh, to talk about uh, anything at the end of it. Uh, if there's particular feedback, uh, if you're getting noise in the background, if you need me to slow down because it's hard to, to understand, uh, anything like that, feel free to pass that along in the chat. I will be kind of paying attention to it, but trying to also stay focused on the talk. Uh, and I will uh, preemptively uh, beg a little forgiveness because I've been um, talking in the Indeed Expo booth uh, all morning. And so my my throat's uh, reaching the end of its life for the day. Uh, so I've got some, some tea to help me stay focused there uh, and to help with that. I will also be available to talk about this, uh, any of these subjects after uh, the talk at the Indeed Expo Hall as well. So um, this talk, who is this talk for? Um, if you've ever wanted to contribute at work, but you haven't known where to start, or you've been hesitant to ask, you've been denied permission to contribute, or you've been doing it secretly without permission, um, or if you've give, been given permission, but you don't feel like you're getting recognized, um, this talk should be um, uh, right in what you're looking for. Uh, if you're an old hand at contributing to work, there may not be as much useful uh, uh, information in the talk here. Um, but if this is you, or if you are any of these people uh, in the list here, then um, I think this talk will have some stuff in it for you. Um, the short version of this talk is that when it comes to making contributions at work, you should start with the things that you use all the time. Uh, you should always ask for permission, um, uh, both because doing it without permission is risky, uh, but also uh, because uh, if you ask, you will open up uh, the opportunity for people to say yes. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing in the chat, at least one person can't, okay, sounds is okay in chat. Um, solve a work problem, the closer to um, your work the problem is that you're solving, the more likely it is that your contributions are to be improved. Uh, you should begin with um, non-controversial contributions, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, and then some guidance on how to find your allies and uh, keep track of the outcomes uh, from your contributions for when you're talking about them later. Uh, so let's talk about where to start. Um, I encourage people to, to begin their open source uh, contribution work with the things that you're using every day. So look for opportunities in your dependencies. Now, um, there are all kinds of different opportunities that might turn up in your dependencies, um, but uh, let's talk about what I mean by, by dependencies. This could be a, a software module that you're bringing in that you're depending on for uh, code that you're writing directly, or it could just be software that you're using every day uh, as part of your work. Maybe you're using VS Code or you're using Atom, both of which uh, you would be able to make contributions to. Or it could be uh, a dependency in terms of uh, this is software infrastructure that you are deploying code onto. These are all different kinds of dependencies. So I mean, uh, dependency in the, in the broadest sense here. 
Um, and there are all kinds of opportunities hidden in these dependencies uh, that you can identify as a place to get started. Uh, there might be missing documentation. There could be incomplete tests. Um, there might just not be a process for how to contribute to the project um, that's been documented. Uh, they might be willing to accept uh, contributions, but not giving any guidance to contributors on uh, what, that uh, what that process would look like. Um, you should also pay attention to see which dependencies have uh, relatively strong communities, uh, a healthy flow of um, contributions that are coming in and out, uh, active maintainers who uh, are engaged uh, with contributors, um, and just a, a broad coalition uh, of folks who are involved in the project. Uh, in particular, uh, paying attention to projects that uh, are dependencies that have good first issues uh, tagged in GitHub uh, can be a great way to help find some of those uh, opportunities to make a contribution. Uh, and I want to spend just a moment here talking about a, a project, that, an experimental project that we just recently released called Mariner. Um, what Mariner does is it takes a list of dependencies or specifically takes a list of GitHub repositories and looks through those repositories to see if there are any issues that are tagged good first issue or otherwise tagged um, or labeled to say that they would be good for first contributors. It is very early days on this project, but this is something that we use fairly heavily internally to get insights into what those contribution opportunities are um, in some of our dependencies. If you're interested in that, if you go to the Indeed Eng org on GitHub, uh, Mariner will be uh, right in there. Um, the next thing that I want to uh, advise you on is to think about the things that would help the business. Which opportunities are going to help the most uh, when looked at from the perspective of your employer? Um, so uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can look at this, but if you think about two different um, contributions that you could make. Um, one of those contributions is only in a dependency that you use, and one of those uh, contributions is in a dependency that is used by dozens of teams uh, ar around the rest of your organization. Um, if you had to pick between the two of those, making a contribution into a dependency that is used by a wider group of the organization um, that, that is an opportunity that can, that can help have more impact on, on the company and have more impact on the business. So um, in particular, look for projects that are used outside of engineering. And the reason I flag this is because um, as, as an engineer, if you're making a contribution um, into something that uh, you depend on, um, you're sort of speaking your own language, right? You, you know, I write JavaScript. I need to make a change into this JavaScript dependency, so I'm, I'm going to, you know, this is all kind of a closed loop. But if there are open source projects that are significantly used outside engineering, the odds are that folks on that team have a smaller set of skills that would be relevant to contribute into the project. Um, you know, if they're not, if they don't have engineering skills, making engineering contributions into those projects will be harder. And so, um, Take a look around and see if there are open source projects that are used outside of engineering, in particular if they use everywhere, uh, to see if you have an opportunity uh, to do uh, a lot of good there. Um, some other things that can uh, that can uh, help you think about the impact of your contribution. Uh, what do you understand the least? Is there a piece of technology that you or your employer just don't understand very well or don't have a lot of internal um, knowledge about? Gaining that knowledge uh, will be helpful. Uh, which things are going to be the hardest to replace if you uh, have to move to a different solution? Um, uh, or are there dependencies that are used by really critical pieces of infrastructure? It may only be uh, a piece of infrastructure that's worked on by a few people, but if a significant amount of your, of your, your traffic or your business flows through that particular uh, set of dependencies, that would be a good place to, to, to prioritize your contributions. Um, and if you're just getting started, the easiest thing and uh, the highest impact that you can do is really start by opening those issues as you find them. Um, and so there are all kinds of situations where, uh, as, as I, I will speak in the specific, as a developer, when I was adopting open source technologies, when I was picking up something new to use for the first time, um, 
I, I would spend a lot of time, like I'd find something where the documentation wasn't quite right and I would, it wouldn't work in my environment and I'd fiddle with it and try to get it to work in my environment or the sample files wouldn't work anymore or there'd be some sort of like undocumented change that I would need to make in order to get it to work. Um, and my typical behavior was I would fight with it until I got it working. And as soon as I got it working, I moved on to the next thing. Um, going back and opening issues in the project is the single most useful thing that you can do in that circumstance. Like maybe you don't have time to fix the bug. Maybe you don't have time uh, to really dig into the bug, but at least reporting out, hey, I had to do some stuff that wasn't really documented here. Um, that gives some signal to the project that they have either additional documentation that they need, or, or there may be just things broken that they don't know about. If you see someone has already filed an issue, you should comment on, on that issue just to give additional signal to the project that there are other folks who are hitting that problem. So whenever you hit an issue, open an issue. Whenever you find a bug, open an issue. If uh, you see the issue already exists, comment on the issue. Tell people that you are also having that same problem. If you get new information, update the issue that you've already opened so that the, the maintainers have the most recent set of information available to them uh, so that they can address the problem. Um, and if you see somebody already appears to be on top of this issue, they're giving great uh, reports, they're talking about what the problem is, if all you do is just give that issue a, a thumbs up uh, or a plus one in the repository, you send signal to the project, hey, this is a, a problem that other people are, happen are having um, and it may be bigger than just this one person. So these are all really easy things to do. It's typically not controversial for um, uh, from an employer's perspective for you to open an issue in a repo if you find a bug. Um, and it can sort of set the stage for the conversation of fixing that issue uh, when you come to it a little bit later. <clears throat> um, so in, in terms of, of also figuring out where it's easy to start, let's talk about what I meant by non-controversial contributions. Um, there are some contributions that will be easier to approve than others. And in particular, if you're just getting started making contributions at work and you're just sort of going through the process of getting your manager on board and getting your employer on board to contributing. Um, staying with, starting with non-controversial contributions can, can help people get used to this idea. Um, things that tend not to be controversial from this perspective, documentation updates and improvements. If you, um, if you find a problem in the documentation and you go back and fix it, it's it's rare that people uh, that your boss or your employer would have an issue for that as long as it didn't take too much time. Uh, improving test coverage, accessibility updates, um, those are those are both things that tend not to be um, controversial from a contribution standpoint. Um, and contributions on the fringes. And so I, I don't want to spend a great deal of time here, but in general, one of the main concerns that comes up when you are trying to bring an employer on board and get buy-in for making contributions uh, is concerns over what a company's core IP is. What are the, the core intellectual property concerns that a company has? Um, they don't want you to give away secrets. They don't want you to give away special sauce. They don't want you to give away anything that might uh, have patents on it uh, or otherwise have some competitive, competitive advantage understanding what the core IP concerns are of your business is an important part of this because as far away as you can get from those when you're first started, um, first getting started and making contributions, the further away from the core IP, the easier it is uh, for people to say yes. So um, by way of example, um, your company probably does not make money um, providing services to customers um, uh, around Kubernetes, right? You might use Kubernetes uh, to deploy some of your technology or to run your product, but you probably aren't selling Kubernetes uh, to your customers. Uh, it's far enough away, it's kind of an infrastructure part of your organization. It would be easier uh, to approve those contributions than it would be to approve contributions that are uh, very close to, to business concerns. I didn't say easy, I said easier, because in some cases it can still be hard. Um, and my, and my final recommendation here is that for your first contributions, avoiding projects that have some kind of legal, legal agreement 
will make it easier uh, to get approval. And what, what I mean here is that there are, are some projects that require you to um, sign something called a contributor license agreement or ask your employer to uh, sign a contributor license agreement on your behalf, um, or others that will use something called a developer certificate of origin, which is kind of a click-through agreement that says, I'm allowed to give you this contribution. They both have about the same effect. There are, are important differences between the two. For this conversation, it doesn't matter. Um, what matters is if you get a block of legal text, you shouldn't agree to it on behalf of your company without getting approval from your, from your company. And if this is the first time through the process of approving contributions, um, that's going to add friction to the process uh, and it may take some time to get folks up to speed. So if the project requires a legal agreement for you to make a contribution, it may not be the best choice to go in as the first contributor and, and to get your first contributions approved. Um, another thing that can help sort of warm your company up to the idea uh, of contributing to open source is if you start doing inner source first. Um, inner source, if you're not familiar, uh, is just taking the lessons from developing open source software and applying them to the way you develop software internally. Um, in, in plain speak, this is uh, finding another team inside your company where you can make a contribution into their project so that you're already modeling open source behavior um, without a lot of the concerns that can sometimes come with getting your open source contributions approved. Um, building a culture of inner source and, and doing your practice of inner source, and in particular, you yourself contributing into projects um, using an inner source model. Um, can help warm folks around you up to the idea of doing open source. And in fact, we've seen uh, InterSource uh, serve as an on-road to open source historically uh, at a number of organizations. I'm going to pause here and take a drink before I go forward. Um, the final thing I want to say here is that as you are getting started in this, it's really important for you to blaze a trail. You want to leave a path that others can follow. If you are the first one going through the process of getting open source contributions approved at your company, the more you talk about it, the more you socialize the experience internally, the easier you make it for the next person to get their contributions approved as well. So talking about your experiences at uh, all hands or at other internal presentations, writing an internal blog post about the process, you might even be the person who starts the open source Slack channel at your employer. Uh, uh, even if it's just you and maybe one other person in there having a conversation about open source, you've provided a space where other people can come find you uh, and a place that other people can connect and get some help. Um, finding a friend and recruiting somebody uh, inside the organization who also is interested in open source uh, is a great way to help kind of uh, blaze that trail and build that practice. Uh, uh, and between the two of you, you could even start a study hall. Hey. Every Friday afternoon from 2 to 4 o'clock, we're going to sit down uh, in this Zoom call, I guess it would be now, or conference room once we are, are back in that place. Uh, and we're just going to like focus on making open source contributions and support each other. Uh, you can sort of serve as that beacon and that trailblazer inside your company uh, to help uh, spread the practice. So uh, I'm going to move on from sort of finding places to start and sort of the beginning of part of the process and spend some time talking about how to get a buy-in from your boss and how to talk to your boss about um, making your first open source contributions. My first question is, have you asked them? Now, I, I indicated at the beginning, uh, this talk was for you if you are contributing but not telling anybody. There are so many ways that you could potentially get yourself into trouble doing that, that I don't even want to bother trying to list them. Um, that is not the path to success and it's not a path to happiness uh, when it comes to contributing to open source. Um, but uh, I have personally heard people say in organizations where I have worked or where organ in, in organizations that I know have open source programs, that they didn't think they were allowed to contribute to open source, or they thought they could get in trouble or fired for contributing to open source, or they might cite the employment agreement. Hey, the employment agreement that I signed says these specific things, uh, and that gave me some cause for concern uh, about uh, contributing to open source, or maybe there's just sort of this, this presupposition that uh, they'll, never, they'll never let me make those contributions anyway. 
uh, or uh, it's too much trouble to try to go out and, and talk about this stuff. Um, and in many of these cases, the person who's, who has said these things hasn't actually asked anyone. Um, and so like, if I was going to give you one piece of advice here, it is to always ask. If you don't ask, you don't give someone the opportunity to say yes. Um, and so I would start by making sure that you ask. Don't be afraid to ask. There are some things that you can do around your ask that can help you um, set up for success. The first question your boss is likely to ask is how much time will this take? Um, and knowing the answer to that ahead of time is going to help. It is very hard to say, yes, you can, contrib can contribute to open source if I'm your manager and I don't know what I'm giving up in return. And not all open source contributions require the same amount of time. It might be something that the work is already done. You just need to kind of sit down and do it. Um, and they would never have known the difference. You just are looking for permission. Um, maybe you want to spend the afternoon doing it, or like it's the kind of thing where you can submit the pull request, but you know it's going to take a little bit of time over the next couple of weeks in order to land that pull request in the project. Um, uh, or it might be you know, significant enough that it's going to be a big part of your quarter or you want to do it on an ongoing basis. If you don't know how much time it's going to take, get an answer to that question or at least get a sense for that question before you approach your boss and ask if you're allowed to. So that's the first question you're likely to get. How much time will this take? The second one, um, what is it? What is it that you want to contribute? And the more you can clearly articulate what the contribution is, the easier it is for your boss to say yes. You want to make it as easy as possible for your boss to say yes, right? So, you know, if this is just updates to the documentation, um, that is different from I'm going to be writing a massive feature that's going to take a, a whole lot of code over a long period of time. So, um, come in with a clear articulation of what the contribution is. Um, maybe all you need to do is there was a, a bug in this library where there was a period instead of a comma and it fixes a bug right, uh, for a bunch of people. That's a pretty easy thing to say yes to. Um, so, you know, it could just be a few lines of code or a couple of files to implement a feature. There's all kinds of different sizes of contributions. Um, and understanding how big the contribution is helps your boss understand if they need to tap someone on the shoulder to get their own kind of approval. By way of, by way of example, if your manager uh, is not familiar with contributing to open source, and you say, hey, I want to go like update the documentation to this, it's probably easy for them to say yes. If you want to contribute a feature, they're probably gonna wanna talk to somebody to make sure there aren't any policies in place around that, right? So know what it, you want to contribute and know, be able to clearly articulate what that contribution is. Um, the next question you are likely to get is why are you doing it? Why do you want to do this? Why are we doing this? Why should we be doing this? And there are a wide range of, of reasons to contribute to open source, but I want to encourage you to frame your contribution um, with benefits. Like who is this going to benefit? And in particular, the closer you can tie those benefits to um, your team's needs, your company's needs, even your needs, the easier it will be for your manager to say yes. Um, I, I always like to use as my sort of pet example, um, the Dungeons and Dragons character generator, right? If you go to your boss and you want to make contributions to your Dungeons and Dragons character generator, and you are a company um, that sells software as a service uh, for sales folks, there's literally no benefit. Uh, it's, it, well, I won't say there's literally no benefit. It's very difficult to draw the benefit line from you being involved in that project on work time to what's good for the company. Um, but if you can tie those benefits to um, things that the team will realize or that you will realize or the company will realize. For example, um, maybe you found a problem in the instructions and you wanna make sure that the next time you come do this, you remember uh, the problem that you had. So fixing those instructions would, is just, even if it's only self-serving for you or for anyone else on the team, you know the instructions will be right going forward. That's a benefit that is easy to understand. Um, if there are other engineers at the company who are using the technology, um, that is a way that you could frame those benefits. Uh, if you have um, an open source library or dependency that you're using that you've had to do something special to in order to get it to work inside your environment, 
pushing that fix upstream means you don't have to maintain your own internal fork. And uh, this is a huge opportunity for you to sort of set the table for this conversation about being how long-term technical debt is, is managed, right? Uh, as soon as you fork something and bring it internal, you own that fork by yourself forever and you make it harder for you to pull in upstream fixes. Um, by pushing those changes upstream, you can stay on more recent versions. You don't have to invest time that you're not gonna invest in maintaining that internal fork. There's all kinds of good that you can realize there. Um, this might also be about reducing business risk. Maybe there is um, a huge piece of technology that no one understands. If you've got a huge piece of technology that you use and no one understands it, you are incurring some levels of business risk um, just because if it breaks, you don't know what to do. So developing that expertise can help um, reduce some of that risk. Um, and this might also be sort of a reputational conversation. There's a lot of desire for this feature. Uh, we could be the ones who step in to do this and it's going to look good for us. It's going to make it easier, easier for us to connect to other developers and other engineers. Um, so uh, we roll back through here for how long is it going to take? What are you doing and why do you want to do it? Um, Above all, make sure that you're solving a work problem. Maybe you're solving this problem for your boss. Maybe you're solving this problem for your team. Maybe you're solving this problem for your employer. But solve somebody's problem. Make somebody's life easier as part of your contribution, even if it's yours. If you're not solving a problem, it will be harder for you uh, to get buy-in uh, for your contributions. Um, so let's finally um, talk about talking to your employer. Not finally, we'll, we'll talk about talking to your employer. Um, this is a shorter section by comparison to the others because if you are an individual contributor who is looking to get buy-in and support, uh, you, it may be difficult to influence um, conversations that are necessary to talk to your employer, but there are some tools here that we can use. And then we'll talk about um, some strategies for accounting for it during uh, any kind of uh, review or evaluations. So um, if your manager is okay, but maybe your employer is not okay, uh, as far as you contributing to open source, the first thing you should do is identify some of your internal allies. You're looking for people who can help you influence open source policy at your employer. And they could be literally anywhere in your company. They might be leads or managers of teams who heavily rely on open source. Um, there could be working groups or guilds that are, that are um, within ecosystems that tend to use a lot of open source. Um, there might be infrastructure groups who deploy on open source technologies and who recognize that they have a reliance on it, but not a culture of giving back to it. Um, or an architecture group who is responsible for sort of looking across the, 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 the entire company and making some strategic decisions. Um, odds are, if the company is sufficiently large, there will be somebody at the director level or above who has a belief or a passion for open source, even if it's not showing up in the, in the way they do their work. Going out and, and figuring out who um, some of these folks are might take a little bit uh, of groundwork. You're going to have to kind of dig into the org chart and see. But you might also find allies in, uh, in recruiting, allies in employer brand, allies in HR. Like They could be anywhere. Um, and uh, it might be a little bit like um, finding somebody at work who happens to also like your favorite band, but you've never talked about that band at work. So go out and talk about open source and see who perks their ears up and see who gets interested in the conversation. And that will help you identify your internal allies. Um, you also have external allies in a couple of different forms. I highly encourage you to engage with the to-do group. Um, the to-do group is a working group of open source program offices. There are a bunch of us in the to-do group that share best practices, that share tools, that share learnings. Um, we can also um, share strategies for helping get your employer on, on board with the idea of you contributing to open source. Um, you should also reach out to open source advocates. Generosity is a core value in the open source community. If you see people out there evangelizing for open source or at conferences like this one talking about open source um, or otherwise advocating for open source, um, either in companies or in the industry as a whole, reach out and get their opinion and ask them for help. Um, the more focused you can make your ask, the more likely you are to get meaningful help. Um, but uh, reaching out and having these conversations um, can also help you find some allies 
And there are plenty of people who would be willing to jump on a call with your manager or your legal counsel or your CTO uh, or anyone at any level in the organization and talk to them about the value of um, both the employer getting involved in open source and you specifically being able to contribute to open source. Um, a thing that can help uh, is uh, to provide some sample policies. There are a number of organizations who have published uh, good documentation about what their open source policies are. Uh, Google has done it, Verizon has done it, Zalando has done it, GitLab has a whole handbook that basically covers all of their um, uh, policies about how, how they work as a company. Uh, and at the to-do group, there is a, a GitHub repo of just policies that have been aggregated over time, folks who have published documentation um, to either provide guidance on how their employees can contribute to open source and they can serve as a model uh, for how your company might approach the problem. So you don't have to write these from scratch. There are many of them already out there um, that you can use as a template. Um, so that's some strategies for talking to your employer, find your allies, tag in some help um, and, and, and use some sample policies to kind of seed that conversation. Um, there are lots of people at your company who are probably interested in having this conversation and through different perspectives or different lenses. Um, I'd be happy to talk about you know, more tactical um, uh, ideas there, uh, either here or at the uh, Indeed Expo uh, booth after the session. <clears throat> so let's talk about getting um, recognition for, for your contributions. Um, most companies have some kind of process that you go through um, you know, either yearly or quarterly or monthly or, or maybe never, but you wish that you there was some kind of evaluation process to look at how you're doing the work that you're doing and giving you feedback on the work that you're doing um, and sort of spreading out the work that you've done over the last X amount of time to, uh, to d make decisions about promotion and career progression. Um, getting recognition for those open source contributions during that process in particular, if you are the first person who has gone in to make open source contributions, um, can be uh, a bit of an uphill battle the first time through. Again, you want to make sure that you blaze a trail um, and leave you know a good path for people who come behind you. But let's talk about getting some recognition for contributions. Now, I will I will confess that um, I would say for the first half of my tech career. I really, really undervalued um, the importance of keeping track of the work that I was doing so that I could participate in reviews and performance evaluations uh, at, at any kind of, of level. Um, this wasn't anything that I was taught. This wasn't anything that my first half dozen managers um, helped me with. It really um, wasn't until about 10 years ago, maybe a little more, I would say that uh, I, I had a manager who sat down and helped me understand um, my role in, in the process. And keeping track of the work that I was doing was a big part of that. So I highly encourage you just in general, if you are dealing with a, a process where you go through annual reviews or quarterly reviews or whatever, to keep a running list of your work. But let's let's focus this in particular um, on, on your open source contributions. Um, if you follow up on issues and pull requests, uh, you will be able to talk more about the outcome of those issues and pull requests. Uh, and I think that's going to be, that's going to be more useful in the conversation than just saying, I opened X issues or I submitted X pull requests. Um, because so what? Like that's just, those are just numbers. Now, I'm not saying that summary metrics aren't aren't valuable. I think it is worth having some summary metrics um, uh, that make it easy at a glance for your manager or for other folks who are looking at, at your um, your contributions to understand what they're looking at. I opened this many issues. There's how many were closed. Um, those kinds of things. They're useful, but they should never be the end of any conversation. They should be the shorthand for the beginning of a conversation. Um, Focus on drawing attention to your top three to five contributions. Um, if you've gotten to the point that you're able to make regular contributions to open source as part of your work, uh, and if you're doing it on a weekly basis, and if you get evaluated once a quarter, that's 13 things that you did over the course of a quarter. 
Um, your manager probably has a bunch of other people to sort of evaluate and look at things and reading through all 13 of those to figure out which were the most impactful or the most important ones that that's likely more work than they're going to be able to do um, and require more time than they'll have. But if you draw attention to your top three to five contributions, these are the sort of the highlights that makes it easy uh, to look at the things that were most impactful. And then you can have a bunch of things that you say, and also I did these other things. Um, and you want to highlight the benefits of those contributions, focus on the outcome of those contributions. So, um, you, you, you open these uh, five issues, and as a result, what happened? You submitted this pull request, and as a result, what happened? And in particular, um, accounting for the long-term benefits and framing those benefits as what your team, how your team has benefited, how your employer has benefited, how you have benefited, and frankly, how your manager has benefited um, are, are all ways that you can frame those benefits of the contributions. Um, in, a, in a way that makes it easier for people to understand and recognize those contributions. Um, you know, I, I, I hear occasionally um, from an open source contributor who says, uh, sort of in a, in, a, in, a, in a frustrated sense, my manager just doesn't understand what I do. You're right, right? Uh, it, it, if, if, if you're making open source contributions and this is not sort of your manager's cup of tea, they probably don't understand it. And the people that your manager is talking to to evaluate your open source contributions, they may not understand it either. You want to make it as easy for your manager to say yes as possible, and you want to make it as easy for your manager and their peers to understand the impact of your contributions. Make that as easy for them as possible, and it will be easier for them uh, to recognize you for the work that you're doing. Um, assume best intent and in, in with these things. And I guess I should have opened with that at the beginning. If you have a relationship with your manager that prevents these conversations, my only real advice is to do your best to find a manager that you can work with and have honest two-way communication. Um, convert, converting someone who, do, you, who you can't even talk to about this stuff is going to be particularly hard. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, as I said in the last slide, focus on the outcomes. Um, draw attention to some specific benefits. There are different categories of benefits that you will realize um, from the contributions. It may be that um, uh, contributing to open source has helped you improve team processes, like how bugs are flown through the process or how bugs are triaged by your team. Or it may have uh, enabled you to bring improvements to other internal projects that might not be obvious on the surface of them. Um, don't be afraid to be um a little generous in how much time you're saving by not having to apply custom patches right if it if it's the kind of thing that that only takes an hour but it takes an hour every two weeks all right so you saved almost half a week of time over the course of the year uh 26 hours uh in in the course of, of pushing this patch upstream um and that's just for the first year right um so be generous with the amount of time that you're saving by not having to apply custom patches. Um, my, my, my estimation is that no matter how generous you are, you're probably underestimating the amount of time it will take to actually manage um, those custom patched and those internal forked uh, open source repositories. You might talk about some specific things that you learned um, from participating in these contributions, whether it's new technologies, new skill sets, um, new processes, just aha moments, um, something like that. Um, and anytime that you see the community um, sort of recognizing you or your employer for the contribution that you've made, be sure to tag those in. You know, if if um, if someone is participating in the pull review uh, process, pull request review process, and they say, "I think it's great that your employer is doing this," like link to it. Right. Provide a link. Provide a link to people saying thank you. Like, make sure that you call out that people are uh, in the community are recognizing your contributions, and it will help send signal to your employer that um, they should also be recognizing it as well. Uh, and and finally, I would call out you can you can look at peers or employees that you have mentored um, as part of the process. Um, this is a, a thing that I think most companies want. They want they want to see engineers uh, and their employees mentoring and helping each other. Uh, and 
tying that kind of work to your open source contribution work uh, is a thing that can help you gain recognition for those contributions as well. Um, so that was a lot. I've got five, uh, I got more than five minutes. I will, I, we're at uh, 20 minutes till the top of the hour. So I can hang out for a while and take questions. Again, I will also be at the Indeed booth afterwards. Um, I thank you uh, for attending the talk. I don't think I can add people to the conversation by video, but if you want to ask questions in the chat here on the side of the session, uh, I'd be happy to, to take them in line here. Uh, Carol says it was a great talk. Thank you, Carol. I will also confess that sitting in complete silence is one of the most difficult things for me to do. So anyone who was clock watching, I made it about 20 seconds before uh, I got a chance to, uh, I felt compelled to say something out loud. Oh, hi, Vicki. I didn't know you were here today. Uh, Vicki speaks at the top of the next hour. Um, I did know you were here today. I just forgot you were here today. I'm sorry. It's been that kind of day. Uh, and thank you, uh, Ray. Um, and good to see you again. It was actually, so Ray Camden and I know each other from back in Adobe days. So, um, uh, Nick, uh, do you have recommendations for keeping track of work you've done? Not necessarily in open source. Do you use any kind of tools to do that? Um, do I have a recommendation? Don't overthink it. Start with a text document. It's going to get you halfway through the quarter before you actually settle on a tool. Um, uh, when I started doing this, I tried to keep a folder of things that I was keeping track of. Um, and that didn't work out so well for me. But really, like my 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 best piece of advice there is whether you do it in a, in a, in a text doc, whether you send yourself emails, start emails, write it in a notebook, doesn't matter. Do it in a series of post-its start doing it tomorrow or start doing it today because um, uh, my own experience is I will spend more time trying to choose the perfect tool or the right tool. Um, uh, and that means I spent less time um, tracking my work. Um, is there a way to get a copy of our slides for reference, of my slides for reference? Um, I have no idea if there's a way to get a copy of the slides, um, but I will do something I generally don't do, which is I will just drop a link to my slides here in the chat. Uh, it is semi-public. Um, so there are slides. And if anyone would like to hit me up on Twitter or email me directly, I will send you a link to the uh, slides or a PDF of the slides afterwards. Um, Alyssa wants to know a great open source contribution I made at work. Let me. Um, scrub to see if there are other questions here. Um, whew, lots of other questions. Um, goodness gracious. Uh, I'm going to take uh, Roseanne Gutierrez's question here. We're looking to start blogging. Do you recommend creating your own or using platforms like LinkedIn or your employee's website? Um, I'm assuming this is in reference to my write an internal blog post about it. Um, uh, and I'll mark the difference between internal or external. Um, my advice for this in particular, when you're trying to socialize the open source contribution work that you have done uh, at work for your internal community is go to wherever it is that they read comment, that really they read their content. So if the company has a wiki that gets a lot of traffic, put it where they're going to find it. If they're, if your company like values a network of internal blogs, put it wherever they're going to find um, that value. Um, if you are able to get permission to talk about it externally, um, my goodness, uh, I guess my first recommendation would be to uh, email open at opensource.com and see if they're interested in the blog post because that will immediately connect you to a wide audience. Um, and I think I got that email uh, address right. If I didn't, I hope someone will correct me. Um, Matthew Foley, what's a good way to get people to give you feedback on your open source project? Don't really have any Twitter followers. Um, 
Matthew, my recommendation would be to find the people that are likely to use your open source project or that could benefit from using your open source project and connect with them where they are, whether those are in virtual meetups or actual meetups when we have those again, uh, if there are existing user communities or people who, who might um, benefit from that project, um, then that would be a, a good place to start. Go to where your users are likely to be because your users are likely to later be the source of your um, uh, contributors. Um, if you don't have access into communities um, where there are users who might need this, um, go to conferences like this and go out into the general networking sessions and look to connect with people and just say, hey, I have an open source project that I need to get feedback on um, and see if you get um, some, I'm sure you will get some folks who are uh, willing to at least take a look at it and, and give you a sense there. Uh, and thank you, David, um, for uh, the confirmation. Open at opensource.com on the blog post there. Um, and there's one more from, uh, two, from Kevin and Alyssa. Kevin, have I heard stories about it being easier or harder for people in non-tech companies to get permission to contribute to open source? Um, I can't speak specifically because um, none of it, um, I can't recall a specific story, but anecdotally, um, uh, the non-tech companies tend to either be, like it, it seems like it runs hot or cold. Either they don't understand what it is and so they don't care, or they don't understand what it is and so they say no. It kind of depends on the level of, of risk um, sort of allergy that the uh, individual company has. If it's a financial services company um, uh, or sort of other high-risk companies, um, there are answers that I would say kind of tend to default to know if it's a design company, um, then they likely are, are not to, to care so much. Um, I think it really varies on, on, on who it is that you're working for. Um, and Alyssa, you asked, what's a great, great open source contribution you made at work? Um, a great one. Um, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> The the most recent thing, the most recent pull request that I submitted um, uh, took a form that was hard to find for the to-do group and uh, made it easier to find in the repo where we keep them. Um, it is the kind of thing that is like, it, it's, it's not earth shaking, it's not groundbreaking, it's not um, like super innovative, but it's going to make this form easier for other folks to find who need it later. Um, and it didn't take very long, and it was just kind of an example of a little thing that um, uh, that was easy to do. Um, open source contributions don't have to be big. A lot of the really valuable ones are just small. Oh, and Justin's here. Oh, and Vicky says, my whole job is a great open source contribution, and you're making me blush. Um, thank you so much for your kindness, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I will hang out here for the next few minutes and then I'm going to jump over to the uh, Indeed booth. <coughs> um, I feel like almost I should ask people to put next to their names if I, if I know them or if they work with me or for me or if they're friends because um, thank you all. Um, it looks like um, questions have dried up here. Any final questions before uh, I drop off this session? Um, thank you everybody for coming. There were a huge group of people here for the talk and that was really exciting to see. Uh, glad um, some of you found it useful. Happy to answer questions. You can see my email address here or I'll be over at the um, uh, Expo Hall in the Indeed booth here in a few minutes. So thanks everybody.